Welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's Science and Health Webinar, Prospects for Health Promoting Pickled Vegetables. I'm Amelia Nielsen Stoll, editor of TFA. We are a trade group that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often healthful food and beverages. Our goals are to help educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, support scientific research into those health benefits, and work with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regards to fermentation. Today, we bring you two great speakers, Dr. Suzanne Johanningsmeyer, a USDA research food technologist, and Dr. Maria Marco, professor of food science and technology at University of California, Davis. We have many questions already submitted and reviewed with our speakers. If you have additional topics you'd like to see addressed, please enter them in the chat box below and we will try to get to them. All right, I will turn it over to you, Suzanne and Maria. Thanks, Amelia. Well, as a member of the Fermentation Association Advisory Board and fellow scientists pursuing research on fermented foods, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Suzanne Johanningsmeyer um, for today's webinar. So Dr. Johanningsmeyer is a leading expert on the chemical and sensory properties of fermented fruits and vegetables. Uh, so Suzanne received her Bachelor's of Science in Food Science at Purdue University. After that, she moved to North Carolina where she received her Master's of Science and PhD uh, <clears throat> in Food Science at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. During that time and since, Suzanne has been affiliated with USDA laboratories located in Raleigh, a location that's world renowned for its research on fermented foods. So Suzanne is currently a research technologist at the USDA ARS. In that position, she has developed an internationally recognized applied research program investigating new approaches that improve product quality and healthfulness of preserved fruits and vegetables. She is also examining how to reduce processing waste and advance the science of fruit and vegetable preservation uh, more broadly. Her current research areas include the characterization of the chemical, physical, and sensory properties of fermented and acidified vegetables and sweet potato products. She's also interested in fermentation biochemistry and the development of analytical methods for small molecule metabolite profiling a topic I think she's gonna to cover today and help explain to us what that is. So uh, today, Suzanne will be sharing her findings on research on the prospects for health promoting pickled vegetables. I'm delighted to have you here today, Suzanne, and I will turn this virtual mic over to you. Thank you, Maria, for the wonderful introduction. And thanks to the Fermentation Association for inviting me here to share some of our recent research with all of you. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and aloha. Um, and greetings to all of you from my home office here in Apex, North Carolina. So to start, let me share my um, presentation with you. So um, to get started, um, as Maria mentioned, I'm a research food technologist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service Food Science and Market Quality Handling Research Unit in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I want to get started by sharing with you a little bit about the Agricultural Research Service and our larger organization. So our unit here in Raleigh is actually um, comprised of five research scientists doing uh, research on product quality and new uses, as well as food safety. And I believe you already heard from two of them in the past few weeks, Dr. Bright, who leads our food safety project, and Dr. Perez Diaz, who works on um, preservation of vegetables. So the Agricultural Research is the United States Department of Agriculture's chief scientific in-house research agency. And there are actually um, more than 600 research projects uh, serving 15 national programs in agricultural research across the country 
We have more than 2,000 scientists um, working in smaller units spread across the country. And you see everywhere there's a dot, then that is a location where um, a research unit is located. And our mission is to deliver scientific solutions to national and global agricultural challenges. And we do that through scientific excellence, creativity, innovation, and collaboration um, in order to develop new tools and techniques um, that are science-based um, that bring innovative solutions for American farmers, producers, industry, and communities and um, support the nourishment and well-being of all people everywhere, as well as our ecosystems. So I mentioned that there are 15 uh, national programs. Um, the one that I work most closely with is the Product Quality and New Uses National Program of USDA's Agricultural Research Service. And um, what we do is conduct research that develops more helpful value-added foods and um, there's also some bio-based um, products, and including biofuels. That's not an area that I work on. Um, we also work on research, though, for this mission to reduce loss and waste through commercially preferred technologies for post-harvest processing, packaging, and storage. And within our USDA Ag Agriculture Research Service Food Science and Market Quality and Handling Research Unit, um, my area of research is focused on vegetable preservation, composition, and quality. Um, and the goal of my program, the long-term goal, is to develop science-based technologies, enable sustainable preservation of fruits and vegetables for production of high-quality, health-promoting consumer products. And we do that through um, several types of studies. Um, often working with undergraduate researchers and graduate researchers at North Carolina State University. Um, we do some very applied product quality studies, as well as those um, investigating new processing technologies for preserving fruits and vegetables, as well as some advanced metabolite profiling and fermentation chemistry experiments that you'll hear more about today. So today I'm gonna to just give you a little bit of uh, a few highlights on the trends that are culminating in this excitement over fermented foods, um, which I'm excited about because I've had a passion for this area since my undergraduate program at Purdue University. And so it's exciting to see um, so much momentum growing in, in the Americas with fermented foods. Um, I'm then going to spend some time giving an overview of cucumber fermentations from the perspective of an analytical chemist, of course. And then I share with you two studies that we performed on bioactive peptides and GABA, which are known health promoting molecules that are formed during lactic acid fermentation of cucumber. I'll talk a little bit about where we are headed in our future research um, given these results. So a number of consumer trends um, have been growing over the past few to several years in plant-based foods, gut health, return to traditions and new flavors, along with things like simple, um, understandable labels and those kinds of things. And all of these things have kind of aligned and intersected at a fermented foods mega trend. So we're seeing a lot of, you know, um, blurbs last year, especially and continuing into this year about fermented foods being on the top 10 of superfoods, um, that it's a mega trend, um, that the growth is expected to be um, accelerating, and that um, a, a major um, proportion of this growth is actually going to happen in the Americas. Um, and so these trends um, are, are really uh, great for a research unit working on pickled vegetables and, and lactic acid fermentation of, of fruits and vegetables because this means that there's momentum and there's opportunities for us to um, partner with industry to um, learn about how to do this in a way that is truly helpful because all of these um, um, trends are based on the belief that these are actually um, health promoting foods for consumption. 
And so when we talk a little bit about the potential health benefits of fermented foods, um, it's important to distinguish a couple different types of health effects. Uh, one is a probiotic effect, and I think it's more than 80% of millennials um, have heard of the term and are familiar, very familiar with the term probiotic. So this is a term that's become very commonplace um, in the food world today. And um, a probiotic effect is elicited when we consume sufficient quantities of very specific and well-characterized live microorganisms that has been proven in clinical trials to provide a health benefit. On the other hand, a biogenic effect is um, delivered by consumption of health-promoting molecules, so substances produced by bacteria that are actually the byproducts of their metabolism and are present in the foods that they have fermented. Um, so our, our research unit has done um, some work in um, developing technologies to be able to deliver probiotic microbes in a refrigerated pickle. Um, however, there are a number of challenges with doing this in fermented vegetables, fermented fruits and vegetables, especially because of their high acidity. Um, and so there are very specific processes that are required in order to keep those microbes alive up until the point of consumption. On the other hand, a biogenic effect um, could have broader um, impacts for fermented fruits and vegetables because um, if those molecules are produced and are stable, they could be um, delivering a beneficial effect even in products that need to be held for a longer shelf life. So we're working, um, we started our studies in cucumber. Um, cucumber is one of the top five vegetables that are preserved in the US. And it's interesting because most of those other vegetables at the top of that list um, are canned or frozen. Um, whereas cucumber is preserved especially well by pickling um, due to its very delicate um, structure. And so we see that through processes like fermentation or acidification, uh, combined with either refrigeration or pasteurization, we can take a very unstable uh, cucumber fruit and that would have a very short shelf life of three days to three weeks um, and preserve that into a tasty and crunchy form um, that's well liked by consumers and has a shelf stability of three months to three years, depending on combination of process formulation and packaging. So with regards to um, the fermentate, the, the type of <laughs> pickle products that are fermented, um, as there are uh, different types of uh, pickle products on the market, um, we were especially interested in the, how the lactic acid fermentation process is um, transforming these cucumbers into a pickle and whether these transformations are adding some health promoting um, compounds to the pickled cucumber. So on a large scale, um, pickling cucumbers, which are about 2% fermentable sugars, are uh, loaded into very large tanks and they're fermented in a field process um, in these large open tanks in outdoor fields uh, called tank yards. And um, the salty brine is added, it may be recycled or fresh brine. Um, and enough salt is added so that once it equilibrates with the cucumber, it's about five to 8% salt. Under these conditions then, um, a natural fermentation by lactic acid bacteria uh, proceeds and we end up with about 1% lactic acid um, and a pH between 3 and 3.4 depending on the buffering capacity of the system. And under these conditions of low pH and high salt, these cucumbers can be stored in bulk storage um, for up to a year and essentially extending the harvest it's very economical um, and allows the processors to then produce 
pickle products um, all throughout the year and have a steady supply of um, these foods. So what's happening during that, um, that transformation then? So um, what I'm showing you here is um, on the x-axis is the time of fermentation. And on this chart are the counts of lactic acid bacteria in the cucumbers. Um, and we see that early on, within a few days of fermentation, we reach a peak number of lactic acid bacteria. And during this time, the pH is decreasing. So the system is becoming more acidic. And we see that as a lowering of the pH. And this is what makes it stable um, both from a safety standpoint and from a microbial stability standpoint during that storage. Um, something that you might note is that um, after they reach their peak, uh, depending on the conditions of the fermentation, we do see a decline in the counts of those lactic acid bacteria throughout the rest of the fermentation period. So, to take a look at what's happening at the molecular level, then we again are looking across the time of fermentation. And on this chart, we're showing you those sugars, those fermentable sugars, um, glucose and fructose being the majority of that in a cucumber, um, are being used by the bacteria. And so these are decreasing in concentration and they're being converted um, to lactic acid as the, by, the primary byproduct of fermentation. So we see that increasing here and that uh, causes the increase in acidity and the lowering of the pH. But when we take a closer look, so this is that, that's what we see. We see um, sugars going down, lactic acid going up and it's very well characterized in ferment, lactic acid fermentation in vegetables. Um, but what's actually going on with the bacteria is that they're using this entire, what's called a metabolic pathway to do that conversion. And we're not seeing all of the cool activities that it's doing in between glucose and lactic acid um, because it does them so quickly and efficiently and inside its cells. Um, so just to, to give you an idea of this, um, we're zoomed in over here and everywhere where you see a green box with numbers in it represents an enzyme that the microbes are using in order to make these conversions. And so everywhere that's highlighted over here in green is an enzyme that uh, lactobacillus, this particular lactobacillus plantarum strain possesses and is able to make all these conversions. And so I show you this um, to show you this more complex picture. Um, so this is the well-known glycolysis pathway um, that's very well characterized and well-known in all lactic acid bacteria. But this pathway only represents a very small portion right in here of this larger metabolic map. And so this larger metabolic map is representing um, all of those pathways that everywhere it's highlighted in a color is a pathway that this particular organism has the enzyme for. And so the point is that lactic acid is not the only byproduct of lactic acid fermentation and that there could be hundreds or thousands of byproducts of this lactic acid fermentation. And as an analytical chemist and someone who's very interested in the composition of foods, I find that fascinating and exciting and a world to explore. So as we set out to find out what else was changing in the composition of cucumber during a natural lactic acid fermentation, we focused first on um, those um, compounds that are known to be health promoting that would be byproducts of protein metabolism or amino acid metabolism. So for our first study, um, uh, Ms. Jennifer Fiddler, now Mrs. Jennifer Fiddler Moore, um, led this project for us and we collaborated with um, Mons Ekeloff and Dr. David Muddyman in the Department of Chemistry at North Carolina State University 
in order to use some advanced mass spectrometry tools to be able to look at whether we could see the formation of bioactive peptides during fermentation. So what is a bioactive peptide? Well, very simply, it's a short sequence of amino acids. So here's an example of one that's a combination of lysine and proline. And these short sequence of amino acids are those that have been shown to produce health benefits when consumed. And, um, and they can be uh, present in the foods or they can be liberated from proteins um, during fermentations. And a couple, uh, several examples actually in the literature have identified these bioactive peptides in other foods that are fermented by lactic acid bacteria, such as fish sauce and yogurt. So we thought there was fairly good potential for this conversion to also be happening during lactic acid fermentation of cucumber. We set out to explore that. So our experimental approach was to first compile an internal database of food-derived bioactive peptides from the literature um, so that we would know that the compounds, if we were to find them, had already been established as having some sort of bioactivity. Um, and then we prepared fermented and acidified cucumbers. Um, we let them have about a six week incubation. We did this in a laboratory scale in glass jars. And we also took samples of our fresh pickling cucumbers at the outset. And then we subjected them to some advanced chemical analysis that I'm going to walk you through. So the reason for us to partner with the chemistry department was because Dr. Muddyman actually in his laboratory um, devised this instrument that can directly sample the cucumbers. One of the challenges that we have in analytical chemistry and food analysis and trying to understand what is the composition of foods is that trying to extract the molecules from the foods can sometimes alter them. So the advantage of this technique is that we're actually able to sample the individual molecules from the fermented cucumber without any extraction processes. So let me walk you through this. So we start out with a, um, a frozen sample of our fermented cucumber. We use a laser to create a paper thin slice of that cucumber and that's pictured here on the left. Then we place it onto a glass slide, just like the glass slides you would look, um, use to look at a specimen under a microscope. And then an infrared laser at a very specific wavelength is applied to the sample. And that infrared laser excites the water molecules in the sample and vibrates their bonds to the point where the material is actually completely ablated and it becomes a plume of individual molecules that make up the sample. And those individual molecules come up into the air above the stage where they're ionized and then transferred to the mass spectrometer for detection and identification. So we see our sample before and then afterward, you see these rectangles. This is where the laser was applied and you can see that the material is gone, that it was sampled directly using this laser method. And we did this for a thousand um, MS scans per sample. Um, the point there is just to say, we needed a lot of data to be able to look at this comprehensively. Um, so we collected these scans and then we created um, an imaging heat map for where the molecules were located in the sample. From those heat maps, then we're able to search um, our heat maps with the information that we compiled on 177 bioactive peptides in the food literature. So what this means is that in foods, 177 of these bioactive peptides have already been identified um, and have been shown to have some type of bioactivity. We then use the information from these um, peptides to create their mass values that we would see in a mass spectrometer. And then 
we converted each of these mass values to an image. And essentially what we're doing is comparing the images for the masses to the image of the cucumber sample. So here we see this was one of our samples and it was a very easy one to analyze because it had some very distinctive holes in it. We can see the edge of our sample is here. So we would not expect to see any molecules in this blank space or in these holes. Um, if we get a, um, an image like this for a specific peptide that we're searching for, then we know that this is not really present in our samples because this, just, um, this is just noise. However, when we get a match like this, where we see that there's, um, there's colorful uh, uh, intensity here, right where the sample is located. So then this is a potential match. So from those 177 bioactive peptides in food literature, we had 11 uh, putative matches for, um, to continue to the next stage to confirm the identifications. And to confirm identifications then, we needed to do another experiment. So we, um, we used more of those same uh, fermented cucumber samples but this time we were looking for specifically those 11 peptides that were potential matches. And we were looking for their um, parent mass, which is the mass of the whole molecule when it's intact. So this is a chemical structure of a peptide here and um, showing the individual elements that it is made up of and how those elements are arranged with respect to each other. And it has a very characteristic mass to charge ratio, or you could think of this in lay terms as its weight. Um, and it's very uh, specific weight and the mass spectrometer can see that. Um, so we take this, um, we select for just this compound and then we apply a higher voltage, which causes this molecule to break and it fragments according to a very characteristic pattern um, because it has these peptide bonds. And so what we see is essentially a fingerprint. So these are the, the mass to charge ratios along the x-axis x -axis and the abundance. And we're looking for specifically the characteristic fingerprint that matches to valine, proline, proline in this example. And if we find that it breaks in its characteristic manner, um, then we say that this is a confirmed match of this compound. So based on these further experiments, we did that. We did this experiment for 11 peptides and we found that five were in fact um, confirmed to be bioactive peptides in the fermented cucumber. So now that we had um, a little better information about the targets that we were looking for, uh, we were able to come back to our lab and use a chromatography mass spectrometry method to develop a way to actually measure the quantities of these peptides in our fresh acidified and fermented cucumbers. And so what you're seeing here is on the x-axis, this is the time that the compound takes to elute from a chromatography column. And so we're showing that we are separating these compounds from each other physically. And then on the y-axis is the uh, relative abundance of those individual uh, components in our samples. And so uh, we were able to develop this method for um, these five peptides of interest which are five um, um, known to be anti, oh, sorry, anti-hypertensive in nature. And we found that four were proline containing peptides and they were produced during the natural cucumber fermentation. Um, they were not found in raw or acidified cucumbers, but they were present in small amounts in the naturally fermented as well as starter culture fermented cucumbers and that lysine proline in particular was actually enhanced in our starter culture uh, fermentation. So with these positive um, uh, results, 
we turned our attention to another small molecule named gamma aminobutyric acid and commonly called GABA um, to look for its potential formation during natural lactic acid fermentation. And this study also was carried out by our doctoral candidate, Jen, and um, a summer scholar with the Food Science Club Summer Scholars Program at NC State, um, who was uh, mentored under Jen for a portion of the program. And so why are we interested in GABA? Well, we know that lactobacillus species that are involved in these vegetable fermentations um, contain an enzyme called glutamic acid decarboxylase, and they can use that to break down glutamic acid into GABA. And when they um, perform this reaction, a hydrogen ion is used up and it's a way for them to uh, deal with acid stress during a fermentation. Uh, glutamic acid is a commonly occurring free amino acid in foods and also a component of proteins. And GABA is known for its antihypertensive and anti-anxiety effects. So again, uh, another good possibility for um, for development of health promoting uh, compounds in fermented vegetables and GABA has been shown to be produced in other lactic acid fermentations as well. So we started out simply just looking at whether there are differences in the GABA content between fresh acidified naturally fermented and starter culture fermented cucumber. And we developed a method, again, using our um, mass spectrometry tools. Um, we developed a method to be able to look at the whole profile of free amino acids in the cucumber. So let me break this down for you a little bit. Um, what you're looking at is um, the three letter codes for a number of free amino acids along the X axis. Along the Y axis is the concentration and the individual bars, the orange, are the fresh cucumber, the blue are the acidified cucumber, and the green and dark blue are the two fermented cucumbers with, without and with starter culture. So notably, glutamine, GLN stands for glutamine, uh, which is closely related to glutamate, but not the same molecule, it was actually the most abundant free amino acid in uh, fresh pickling cucumbers. And so much so that we had to put it over here on its own scale so that we could see the rest of the figure. Um, and that it's not stable in the acidified um, and fermented cucumbers. We see that the quantities are much lower in those forms. Um, the next most abundant was actually GABA itself. So this is actually the first um, report where we're actually reporting the concentrations of GABA in a fresh pickling cucumber. That was not already known. Um, and we see that in the acidified cucumber, it is lower. And this is consistent with the dilution that we would expect um, because we're adding brine to those cucumbers. Um, However, the fermented and starter culture fermented cucumbers were both had more GABA than the acidified cucumber. So we chose to continue our investigations into how this is formed and whether it is stable. So in, an, in a follow on study with multiple lots of cucumbers, then we see um, that we have in the fresh pickling cucumber um, about 0.8 millimolar of GABA, and that in the blue is the acidified cucumber. So as we progress through time, we're getting um, a reduction in the amount of GABA, and this is consistent with dilution of this water-soluble um, amino acid into the brine. Um, after that, it is stable throughout the storage period. Um, however, in the fermented cucumber, we see an increase in the GABA content and that it stays stable during storage. Um, this increase, it maxes out about three days. So this is happening pretty early during the lactic acid fermentation, remains stable. 
However, um, if these are fermented in high salt, as is currently done commercially, then a desalting operation and repacking in fresh brines is pretty common. And we end up with about the same level of GABA as if we had taken a fresh pickling cucumber and just directly acidified it. So we wanted to look at um, how, what differences we might see in a low salt fermentation, because one way to get around the desalting is to ferment with less salt and then pack it directly for consumption. So we did a follow on study um, to look at the impact of different levels of sodium chloride salt in our fermentation system. And we actually found that not only would we not have to worry about dilution, but that we also had a much higher or significantly higher amount of GABA formed in the low salt fermentations where we may be selecting for a slightly different group of microorganisms. So with that, we wanted to look into the current commercial products that are on the market and see how, um, how our laboratory results might compare to actual commercial products because we were expecting to see some GABA in these products based on our findings. Um, so in general, there are two types of um, pickled cucumbers, acidified and fermented, and both of those are found in both the shelf-stable forms as well as refrigerated forms. And we um, took a number of products from different producers and tried to get at least two lots of products from each producer when possible. And so what we found was that there was really no difference um, in GABA content due to it being refrigerated or shelf stable. But where we saw the differences is where we expected based on our findings, which was that the acidified, uh, directly acidified cucumbers and the fermented and further desalted and repacked cucumbers had the lower levels of GABA and that they were on average similar. Um, however, the fermented desalt and repacked cucumbers had a wider variance, um, probably because um, the levels of desalting that are done commercially vary from one uh, processor to the next, depending on how much salt they need to remove. Um, and then promisingly, those products on the market that were fermented and directly packed um, into in their fermentation brines, so no dilution, had the highest content of GABA. And this would deliver about five milligrams of GABA in a single pickle sphere. So in conclusion, um, we found that proline-rich bioactive peptides in GABA were formed during natural cucumber fermentation. Lysine proline specifically, um, a, a little dipeptide was formed in higher concentrations when a starter culture was added. And that the highest content of GABA in finished products could be achieved with low salt fermentation prepared for direct consumption, delivering about five milligrams GABA per pickle sphere. So current studies that are ongoing are, we're also looking at ways to enhance GABA even further in uh, pickled vegetables through starter culture selection and process optimization. And um, also expanding the range of molecules that we are investigating using a non-targeted chemical analysis approach. So um, it's now really known that there's thousands of uh, substances called molecules in every food that we eat, and most of them are yet to be identified. And so we, we started these um, studies looking in a very targeted way, looking at things that we knew uh, were happening in other lactic acid fermented foods um, to show that they um, do in fact also occur in a, in a cucumber product. And so now we really want to expand that and look more globally at all of those compositional changes that are occurring and look for the discovery of additional health promoting compounds there. And then um, also expanding this not only to cucumber, but to other um, fruits and vegetables that are fermented or could be fermented as a means to preserve them. 
So um, this research was funded by USDA um, through national program on product quality and new uses and um, would not have been possible at all without our wonderful uh, doctoral candidate, Mrs. Jennifer Fiddler Moore, um, who's just done an excellent job in conducting these studies. Our partnership with the, the chemistry department and our um, summer intern, Ms. Rachel Duvivier. And special thanks to Malif Pickle Company for supplying all of the cucumbers and pickling supplies for our research, as well as Ms. Sandra Parker, um, the most fantastic administrative assistant you can have, and she facilitates all of the, the research in our unit. If anyone has additional um, questions they would like to ask after the webinar, my contact information is here, as well as if anyone is interested in collaborating in these future studies, um, please feel free to reach out to me. And I think with that, we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, that was really fascinating. Um, so I particularly like the part in your talk where you pointed out that these uh, pickles are not just lactic acid, <laughs> that there's a lot more to them. And um, with your background in analytical chemistry, it's so great to have you working on this topic. So my first question for you um, is how scalable are these, what look to be pretty sophisticated chemistry tools that you're using? How, how scalable is this something, for example, are we going to be able to measure bioactive peptides routinely in these foods? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so at present, these methods are being used um, to give us a better understanding of what is, what are the changes taking place during fermentation? Um, how are we transforming the food? Um, but they are not intended, it's not going to be something at least at this moment that then someone sets up in their lab and measures, you know, a particular compound. Um, so the goal is for us to understand what are the best processes to use, because I know food processing is, is kind of a term that everyone, um, it, it has a negative connotation, but actually fermentation is processing. And as you can see, processing can be good. You know, processing can add things and certainly make food available to people year round. So, um, so the idea with these analytical techniques, because they are very advanced and not everyone has them, is to understand what are the methods we can use to improve our food supply and, and then implement those technologies on the processing side. Um, more so than that we're going to test every food that we make for all of these molecules that we're finding. So I have to get my microbiology question in as a microbiologist. Uh, so in your experience so far with measuring these compounds, um, you, know, you do see some variation. Uh, how much of that do you think is going to be due to strain differences or do you expect this to be a general property of these fermented foods because of the bacterial growth? Okay, so um, what we've seen is that some of that variability that we see is actually variability in the composition of the incoming cucumber. So we're starting with slightly different amounts of uh, GABA and the glutamate precursor at the beginning of the fermentation. So part of that variability is the, the fruit, vegetable, that, you know, cucumbers are called both. <laughs> um, and then we fairly consistently, even in a natural fermentation, are seeing full conversion of whatever the free glutamate was, is getting fully converted to GABA. So it seems that in this, for that particular, in that particular case, that whatever free glutamate is there, 
will get converted to GABA by the natural microbiota, even different lots of cucumbers coming from all different um, geographic locations. Great, yeah, thank you for that. That, that definitely um, broadens my perspective on it. Um, just gonna ask, I think, one more question here. Um, so these are exciting compounds and we know that they have neuroactive properties or antihypertensive properties. Uh, did you find enough? Are there high enough quantities in these foods that they would actually make a difference? Do you think they would affect our health in the levels that are currently produced in um, pickles? Yes, a great point. Um, for the bioactive peptides, those were relatively small quantities compared to what have been found in dairy foods and in sausages, for example. So it's one of the reasons that we diverted to looking at the free amino acids and possible a generation of GABA was because the quantities of those peptides were very low. Um, the GABA, uh, we actually think that if we could get, um, if we could convert the glutamine to glutamate, then we would have really significant levels of GABA um, present in those, you know, in a, in a single sphere. But even the five milligrams is, um, it's, a little lower than what has already been tested, but it's it's a substantial amount. So it's um, it needs to be tested. I guess the short answer is we would need to test. I mean, we would need if someone really wanted to make a health claim, then we need to do a clinical trial. Um, my thought process is that you have if you have. Um, hundreds of molecules in low levels that all have health impacts that your whole food may have an impact that you don't see in an individual quantity of an individual component. But that certainly needs to be tested and um, hopefully at some day before I retire, we'll get to the level where we have this comprehensive knowledge of the composition of foods and be able to partner that with people doing clinical trials and really start to see some of these synergies. But that's, it's down the road. We're not there yet. <laughs> that's, that's great. I think that kind of tags on to another question that I've been thinking about as you're, as you're throughout your talk um, is what is the greatest challenge here for health benefits and fermented foods and your experience in chemistry, sensory studies? It sounds like that kind of wraps it up in a nutshell. Is that right? Yes, because even there, there are some, there have been some papers published on uh, small clinical trials in other fermented vegetables like sauerkraut and kimchi and, and or kimchi, I know. Um, but even in those, um, like I haven't seen that direct comparison between the same vegetables with and without fermentation. That's what I would love to see because we know, I mean, there's tons of epidemiological evidence about the health promoting properties of vegetables. So themselves. So I think the, the idea here is how do we, how do we preserve them so that we retain or enhance those inherent health promoting properties. And yeah, I think that this um, abilities that we have now to more comprehensively look at composition are gonna help us understand that in the future. Thank you, very right, excellent. Um, Suzanne, yeah, I've got some audience questions for you if you're ready. Um, okay, so we had a question, you know, there's been a lot of talk about scientific, there's been a lot of scientific and regulatory discussions around defining and regulating the term probiotic. Is there similar discussion for the term biogenic? Ah, not that I know of. And I think this kind of gets at also um, the question of, from Maria about measuring the content of things. If, um, clearly health claims and labeling are FDA's realm, so they're the experts on that. But 
I do know that if someone were wanting to make a content claim, like if they wanted to say this product contains five milligrams of GABA, then they have to prove that it contains, they would have to have a method, they would have to measure it in-house. Um, so I really don't think that's maybe necessarily the, the direct value of this type of research as much as it is, you know, educating ourselves and consumers about how food is processed to make it available to us all the time and what are the best ways to do that so that we retain and enhance health promoting compounds, things that are known to be beneficial to us. Yeah. We, uh, we had a question kind of similar along what you just said. How, how would a brand go about making marketing, making these marketing statements about health benefits of fermented foods, foods. Sounds like they need to be really careful to yes. do that research. <laughs> yes, and I've actually, I've seen a number of things um, and I love the entrepreneurial spirit, but I have seen a number of things that as a scientist, I wonder how they are making those statements. <laughs> yes. You know, because I see a number of things and I think, wow, are they really measuring that? You know, that's pretty sophisticated. So yeah, I think, um, being careful consulting FDA, that's, you know, the way to go there. Okay, so what about amino acids? What do those add as far as health benefits? So a number of amino acids are essential um, to our health. Um, and they, they play roles in a number of our physiological um, pathways. And so um, the one that we were specifically focused on was GABA, um, which actually, um, um, is, an ant is known to be antihypertensive and anti-anxiety. And I think the, the, the interesting thing about it is they actually did a feeding study with GABA um, as a supplement and they fed it to people and then had them walk over a suspension bridge so one of these bridges that's really high and like basically they measured their anxiety levels of, of walking across this. So I thought that was a pretty interesting, you know, approach to, to looking at this and it'd be fun to, you know, feed people pickles and then get them to walk across the bridge, I think. Um, Christopher Shockey, who is our, he's going to be uh, hosting our webinar on October 28th on cider making, he asked following up with GABA, uh, so does this mean eating a fermented pickle before bed might help with a good night's sleep due to high <laughs> GABA levels? I would like to know if he tries it and it works, then maybe we'll <laughs> set up a clinical trial for that. <laughs> okay, so what type of salt do you guys use in your research? So um, for our research, we're using just um, sodium chloride pickling salt for the most part. We have done some um, experiments with using calcium chloride as the only salt, which I know uh, Dr. Perizia has also referred to in her webinar. So anyone that didn't see that could, could watch that. Um, and there have also been some, uh, some work using a mixture of uh, sodium, calcium, potassium, and magnesium salts to try to get a better, um, a more balanced uh, salt blend. And so all of those have, I think, some potential. So your slide on um, in research into lactic acid bacteria metabolism, do you add the lactic acid or is it the result of the lactic acid bacteria metabolism? It's the result of the metabolism of the lactic acid bacteria. And are any of those, um, the lab by byproducts, are they unsafe, like toxic or carcinogenic? <laughs> so um, some lactic acid bacteria can make compounds called biogenic amines. Um, so it's a different pathway than the ones we were talking about today. And so um, some of the work actually by Dr. Perez Diaz, when she's looking for starter cultures for vegetable fermentation, she's screening them to select those that do not have that um, capability. Oh, that's great. All right. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Maria, for also being here with us. Um, we didn't get to everybody's questions, but I am going to put in our chat box 
Uh, Suzanne has generously offered to answer any questions over email, so I will go ahead and put her email in there. It was also um, in her presentation. We will post a recording of uh, this presentation on TFA's website, along with a copy of Dr. Dr. Joe Hanningsmeyer's presentation in the next 24 hours. Um, thank you again so much. Uh, we also have a number of great webinars coming up in the next few weeks, uh, including our next one on October 7th with Sander Katz and Mara King. During October, we also have sessions with Charlie Galish, Michael Ganzel, and Kristen and Christopher Shockey. Please go to fermentationassociation.org to check these out and to register. And while you're there, subscribe to our YouTube channel. All right, thank you again for joining us, Suzanne and Maria. Thank you. Have a good one.